Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to be talking about prayer in class this morning, an aspect of prayer that isn't just your normal prayer. Um, and I'm going to be teaching a lot, which I don't ever do, from this book, Kneeling on the Promises by James Gall. Um, the Lord's just had a way of leading me to books and teachings and different speakers and things just because I'm pursuing him. And, and he'll, I'll just feel this desire to go on YouTube. You know, I'll type in YouTube and it'll come up and then I'll think, hmm, who do I need to listen to? And a name will come to me that I've maybe heard somebody mention or, you know, whatever. Type them in, pick one of their messages, and it's exactly what the Lord has for me. And the same way with books. Um, some books I've bought felt led to buy and haven't read them for a month. But when I did read them, oh my goodness, I'm just devouring this, for instance, this book, because it's exactly where I'm at in prayer. And he's teaching me, and things I already knew, but reinforcing them. And So <clears throat> on my heart has been awakening and revival. That's just what God has been dropping in me lately, and I just can't get away from it. And um, as I told our church last Sunday when I was preaching... Um, you know, when I first started coming to God and, and, and woke up to Jesus in the presence of God, it was all about me and just spending time with him because he was healing my heart and, and ministering to me and speaking to me and telling me how wonderful I am and how he sees me. And then it gradually turned into being all about them, all about our church, all about the world and and it's not about me anymore, and I kind of miss that time where everything is about me. <laughs> but it's, it's what God's put on my heart, and so it's very fulfilling as well. Um, and so in this book, it's, it was just prophetic intercession, you know, kneeling on the promises, prophetic intercession. Well, in it, he's talking all about awakening and revival. And why would, why would God even care about awakening or revival. Have any of you read up on revival or, or listened to people preach yeah, about what happens? Revivals and stuff. <clears throat> what happens during revival? People get <laughs> saved. People get saved. Okay. Cities are trans yeah. Yeah. transformation of yeah. families yeah. and cities yeah. and individuals and churches. What, anything different, Barb, that you were? <laughs> yeah, transformation. How about you, Chris? Have you heard anything about revival? Just really big manifestations of the Spirit. Yeah, people get healed and there's prophetic everything. Yeah. <laughs> and Signs and wonders. Signs and wonders yeah. and God is there. You know, he shows up and... I think that's his heart all the time. That's the Garden of Eden, walking with the Father in the cool of the day, you know, where you have everything taken care of and, you know, you're just blessed beyond measure. That's what he wants for us all the time. But we have to pray it into existence. We have to pray to get there so that it's happening. And it is happening in other places. We hear about it, you know, and we get excited because there are other cities and other churches and towns where this is happening. Even countries where God's just taken it over. But why? What leads up? What precipitates God taking over? God pouring himself out. God showing up in such a big way on so many people. It's tons and tons of kneeling on the promises. It's prayer. And, and us pursuing him. And people who care about it. And, and I don't know, I don't hear anybody else talking about awakening and revival because I have somewhat of a puppet ministry. You, you're hearing me now talk about it. Um, maybe it is on other people's hearts. It is. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've been talking about awakening for a couple of years, yeah. I mean, at least three well, years. Well, I don't hear it on a weekly basis. Awakening. It's in me all the time, yeah. but I don't hear the people I'm around talking yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. It's like consuming me. I don't hear anyone else consumed by it. Yeah. And that's what it requires, at least what I've read from other people in the past. You have to be consumed. But it's because the Spirit of God consumes us. Yeah. And so that's why I wanted to teach it, because, or, or at least this type of prayer, which is the prayer of tears that I want to talk about today. Um, because if we hear about it, whatever we hear about, we get permission to walk in. And whatever we hear about, then God can fall on us in that area. I mean, he can do it before we hear about it. But I've noticed when I see something or I hear something and I learn about something, he starts moving in that area. 
And, and there are other things he's moved in that I've learned about afterward. Like, he didn't tell me about it ahead of time. He just did it. But I know when I do hear about something, then it's like it gives him permission to move in us. So um, let's look just at one scripture real quickly. James chapter 5. So it has a lot to do with passion and feeling, like, like getting excited about God and moving with God and sensing his presence and being passionate about the things of God. James chapter 5 and verse 16. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That's the NIV. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I don't know if that's King James and New King James, but that's a very different meaning. He's talking about effective prayers being fervent prayers. Effective prayers are fervent prayers. And what is fervency? If you feel fervent about something, what are you feeling? Um, passion. Yeah, passion. Passion. Fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like consume. You, you feel very strongly. Your emotions are tied up in it. If you yeah. feel fervent about something or you are fervent in prayer, you, your heart is totally in it. Yeah. So the effective prayer of a righteous man is also a fervent prayer. And it will avail much. And we could take the the contrast of that or the opposite. Prayers that are half-hearted are going to get half-hearted results. Prayers that are not fervent are not going to be looked at fervently by God. He's saying our prayers are effective when they're fervent. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So you also need to know where you stand with God. You, You have to be a righteous person standing in, in right standing with God, knowing who you are. Otherwise, you might not pray properly because, you, you don't, you know, because you're, you're not sure of who you are, you don't know where you stand, you might not pray in faith because, oh, I don't know if God will listen to me. But if you're standing in righteousness, you know you're in a right place with God and you're going to pray more effectively. Okay, so on, on page 59 in this book, I'm going to be reading a number of quotes. <clears throat> um, R.A. Torrey writes, The prayer that prevails with God is the prayer into which we put our whole soul, stretching out toward God in intense and agonizing desire. If we put so little heart into our prayers, we cannot expect God to put much heart into answering them. So our prayers, effective prayers, have a lot to do with our hearts being engaged It has to do with desire. You know, faith is earnest expectation. If you have faith for something, you are earnestly expecting it. I woke up one morning a few months ago, and the Spirit of God said to my spirit, get excited about the things that are soon to be fulfilled. It's in my journal, something like that. He said, get excited, and I'm thinking, I don't know if I should get excited. That makes me nervous. Why? Because I could be disappointed. If I get excited, I could also get disappointed if it doesn't happen. But he told me, get excited about the things that are to come. Fulfilled, whatever. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so he was telling me, get your faith out there. Get, become fervent. Start thinking about it, desiring it, dreaming about things. Get excited. Be fervent. The opposite would be just relaxed, you know, kicked back, just going through life. But if we're fervent, it's like a different posture. We're engaged. We're we're leaning forward. We're listening. We're watching. We're we're open to the spirit, and we're waiting for God to do something. And when he falls on me, I'm I'm engaged. I'm ready to pray. when, When a longing comes on me to go into prayer then I'll go with it because I'm fervent, I'm, I'm engaged, and I'm ready to respond to whatever he wants me to do. Because, you know, in, what is it, in Ezekiel, there's a scripture that, that says, you know, God sought for a man to stand in the gap, and he couldn't find anyone, so he destroyed the people. <laughs> you know, he wanted somebody to say, no, God, don't. Or in our cases, yes, God, do, come, show up. Pour out your spirit. Fall on us. We want here. Here. We're here, God. <laughs> right 
here <laughs> and in Crawford County and Erie County in my church fall on us here. He's watching and he's looking. His eyes are running to and fro all over the earth, you know, to try to find somebody. Can I find one person who will be passionate and fervent and pray so that I will show up and flip their worlds upside down? He's looking for people who will do that. And I believe he's going to start moving more and more on us to um, move in this kind of prayer that I'm going to be talking about. Okay, <clears throat> so he talks about um, Wesley Duell of OMS International, and he talks about prayer. He said, prayer, passion, is incubated in a heart of love. So we have to fall in love with Jesus first. It increases out of holy desire. So there's that desire I was talking about. Number three, it may be a special gift of God, <clears throat> empowering you for the precise moment he wants to use you in prayer. So he'll start dropping things into your spirit. And as you sense things being dropped into you, you have to look into them and pursue them and go after them to get understanding of what he dropped in so that you're ready to act on it whenever he wants you to, to pray in tongues or you know whatever he wants you to do. He might want you to declare it. He might want you to start speaking something out your mouth in declaration that this is happening, that this is on its way. Um, it often springs forth from a new vision of a need as your eyes are opened. That's why we need to be praying Ephesians chapter 1 every day. God, open the eyes of my heart. Give me understanding. I need to see in the Spirit. I need to hear in the Spirit. Because if we're watching and we're looking and we're waiting and we're expecting, then he can drop things in us and we won't be unaware. We won't be caught unaware. We'll be aware and engaged, and then he's got that person he was searching for. It's you. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> and you're ready for it. Number five, it may escalate in your life from a gradually deepening conviction of the urgency of that need and God's willingness to meet that need. And that's what's happening to me. Just It's been this gradually deepening conviction that's just like layer upon layer. He keeps laying this thing on me that, man, we need to cry out for revival and awakening. Number six, it grows within you as you continue to give yourself to intercession, so it will increase, but that's the sowing and reaping law. If you give yourself to it, it will increase. You have to want it, though, because it takes energy. It takes effort. It's, it's a sacrifice. It, you know, your sinuses can get filled up when you're crying and, you know, and you're listening intently, and sometimes there's even frustration because we feel like I need to be hearing more than I am, and, you know, like, God, where are you? Give me more, and... And he wants, he's drawing us into that. If we ask for more, he'll give us more. So he gives us that sense of frustration sometimes. One thing that he's been dealing with me about <clears throat> is um, I'm not, he's like, I I'm afraid to get compassion because I know it's going to hurt. It's like, you mm. know what, you can't care for people when it doesn't hurt you. Yeah. You know, you yeah. have to feel, you feel that. their pain. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's like, yeah. okay, True. I'm willing, you know, I'm willing to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so now it's, you know, I mean, because you have to have compassion to pray. Yes. Effectively. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> the last one is it will revitalize <coughs> and strengthen your faith. Um, ah. <laughs> Right after that, Finney advised, if you find yourself drawn out in mighty prayer for certain individuals, exercised with great compassion, agonized with strong crying and tears for a certain family or neighborhood or people, let such an influence be yielded to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you need to do it. <laughs> He's saying yes. Okay, we're looking now at Luke 19.37. I'm just going to start reading while you get there. When Jesus came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. And they were saying things like, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Luke 19, 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he said, I tell you, <clears throat> if they keep quiet, the stones are going to cry out. Somebody has to praise God. Somebody has to make declarations. Somebody has to exalt the name of the Lord. And if we don't, he's saying it, it has to happen. 
It's, it's, it's got to happen, and so the stones will. You know, all of the earth is groaning and waiting for the sons of God to be made manifest in, in all of our glory and all of our power and everything that God's given us, our inheritance. All of the earth is groaning and waiting for us to step out into our callings. And he's saying, like, we need to cry out and we need to praise God because it will open up things for us. It will open up avenues for us. And I think there's just this, like, a spiritual law that he must be praised. He must be worshipped. I just love that scripture, seeing that again. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come, will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, um, then down towards the end, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So my point in reading the scripture is we need to be recognizing the time of visitation. We need to have our eyes open, our ears open to recognize God is moving in our midst or God is hovering and he wants to move in our midst. Mm -hmm. And if we don't give into it and we don't agree with it and we don't cry out and obey the stirrings of our hearts, he will keep moving and he'll move on to some other place where people are crying out for what he has. He will just move on. You know, Jesus, he went to the one town, couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief, and he left the town and he moved. He moved on to another one. I can't, you know, and one teacher I heard taught people just didn't bring anyone out. The sick just weren't brought out. He, he could only, you know, he healed a few headaches or whatever, a few minor things. Because people didn't have faith. They didn't believe. They didn't recognize the day of visitation. They didn't recognize God was in their midst. Well, God is in our midst today. We don't have to have him in physical form, in a robe, you know, with shaggy hair, or whatever he looked like. He's here. He's wanting to visit us, and he's trying. He's coming in here and there, little bits, little times, individuals, churches, places. He's, he's reaching into our world. And we need to recognize this day of visitation. <clears throat> but Jesus, in verse 41, it says he wept over Jerusalem. He's like, come on, guys. Why can't you recognize what's happening here? Why aren't, you, why aren't your eyes open? In Matthew, like, maybe 11, you know, it talks about people's eyes are closed and, the, and their ears are shut and their hearts are hard because they chose that. They chose it. And he's like, but if you just open them up, I, I would heal you. I would do these things. You, you just have to open up to me. Just engage with me. Get hungry. Pursue me. Open your hearts, and, and I'll drop awesome things into you. I don't think it takes much. Yeah. You know, the mustard seed of faith. He's like, it just takes this little, the tiniest of seeds, a little tiny bit. But, and a lot of us, you know, we all have faith. We all believe, and we're not seeing what we want to see. And I believe it's because of that, you know, the bread guy. I taught about this a few weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> maybe it was in prayer on a Wednesday night. That, that importunity, that uh, reckless, abandoned, I must have this pursuit of the things of God. Going after it tirelessly and ceaselessly. And we'll, we'll see that in the scripture we're going to go to. <clears throat> okay, I want to read another quote. Maybe on page 62. You ever get the book? You want to look it up? Um, salvation, several Salvation Army officers in the last century asked General Booth, how can we save the lost? And Booth stated simply, try tears. <laughs> try tears. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Tears will often come when you are praying fervently and effectively because your heart gets engaged. Your emotions get engaged. <coughs> the weeping, weeping prophet Jeremiah bore his heart. Their heart cried out to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief. Give your eyes no rest. Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the watches. Pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands toward him for the life of your young children. I mean, he, had to, he was like, you know, they're fainting from hunger at the head of every street. And he's like, people, 
Cry out to God. <laughs> your children are suffering and you're not crying out. What is wrong with us? You know, the times have not changed. <laughs> we have horrible atrocities, but we're so desensitized. They're all around us, but we're so used to them. We're not, you know, we aren't crying out for God to come and save us. I'm walking through Walmart yesterday. I think I heard, I wasn't sure if, if I heard, you know, there's a lot of voices and noises and motion and I thought I heard somebody swearing at a child, and and I was like in a crowd, and I I don't know, I don't even think I turned around, but I thought to myself, oh my gosh, how could that, how can an adult be doing this? You know how how could our society come to such a place? Mm -hmm. I think we need to have our eyes open, and we need to become sensitized and have that compassion, so that we start like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, so that you know we have rivers of tears so that we give ourselves no rest because we are so hurt by our society and hurt for our society on their behalf. This is not right. And yet he's like, come on, people, cry out. <laughs> let's do something about this. Let's get on our knees. Let's get on our faces. Let's, let's engage God and ask him for a transformation of our county, of, of northwestern Pennsylvania. Let's ask him to move in our midst. He'll do it if we ask, and on the other hand, if we don't ask, he won't do it. But he'll do it if we ask, if we keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. <clears throat> <clears throat> Evan Roberts was like a particle of radium in our midst, the Welsh Revival. Its fire was consuming and felt abroad as something which took away sleep, cleared the channels of tears and sped the golden wheels of prayer throughout the area. I have wept now until my heart is supple. In the midst of the greatest fearfulness, I have found the greatest joy. Now the bed, my bed, belongs to the river, the river of tears. And Wales belongs to Christ. <laughs> They had, they cried, they cried for the, you know, the pain of their, their society. They went to God with such a heart, you know, rend my heart, rend the heavens and come down, rend my heart, and, you know, <clears throat> and now Wales belongs to Christ. <laughs> but Wales didn't belong to Christ until their, first, their beds belonged to the river of tears. They, you know, they... I put wrote in here, Crawford County, northwestern Pennsylvania, belongs to Christ. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon, let us learn to think of tears as liquid prayers and of weeping as a constant dropping of importunate intercession. Importunity is the guy in Luke 11, shameless audacity, you know, knock, knock, knock. I've got a friend who came to town. I need bread. And the guy's like, no, everybody's in bed in my house. Go away. No, no, I, I need, you're my friend. I need bread. Knock, knock, knock. No, go away. And because of his shameless audacity, because he kept asking for it, the friend gave him the bread. And God is not the guy who's like, go away. It's, it's us. It's a picture of us. Knock, 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 and not stopping. So you can ignore the guy in bed. He represents nothing except the fact that we need to go after what we want from God. Our, God, our tears are so important to God that he collects them because it says he collects our tears in a bottle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that scripture's in here somewhere. Um, I don't think I wrote it down. <clears throat> but yes, it's in the Old Testament. I think it's in Psalms. There will be no public reaping without some public weeping. The greatest reapers are the greatest weepers. Ministry in the last days is worth everything. It will cost everything. Are you willing to pay the price in much tears and much prayer and supplication? We need to pray as Jesus prayed, with strong crying and tears. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> so that, um, that was Paul Cain. What if all of us were called upon to accept God's gift of tears before he would ever consider giving his gift of revival? Would you apply for the gift? Would you seek of the gift? Would you beg for the gift? If you really want revival, I believe you would. Let's try tears. Let's try tears. It's not the tears, it's the heart behind the tears. But then the tears, he does collect in a bottle, it says in, I think it's in Psalms. Yeah. <clears throat> mm. 
Yeah, Psalm 126. <coughs> Let's turn there. Yeah, I think I, I think I need to teach this maybe the next time, or something, some variation of this next time I preach on Sunday, which will be in a couple weeks. Because I want to get the whole church engaged. Definitely. Psalm 126, verse 5. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. So tears are like seeds. You know, whatever you sow, you'll reap. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. So you go out with these seeds that are your tears, and you come back with a harvest. You come back with results. You don't just keep weeping. There may be, I mean, you know, we've heard stories of years, people crying out to God for years or months or weeks or days, but eventually they're... There's sheaves that you come back, there's a harvest you come back with. It's not <clears throat> in vain that God wants us crying. There's a reason for it. Our tears we need to look at as seeds, and these seeds are going to grow. They're going to produce a harvest. Um, <clears throat> in Romans 8, 26, I don't know what time it is. Uh, still don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, let's just go there. Romans 8, 26 and 27. <clears throat> 9.30? Okay, good. I still have time. Thank you. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. <coughs> <clears throat> um, in verse 26 of Romans 8, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Or groan, groanings too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. <clears throat> because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Um, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Those two say about the same thing. So there, there is a prayer that is wordless. And I so frequently feel when I'm praying in English, like I pray, I feel like I feel inept, you know, like my words just aren't powerful enough. But when I'm praying in wordless groans or in tongues, I, you know, I know, I know that God is praying through me. And so I feel like every moment is full of power and accomplishing something and going out and, you know, just hitting the mark perfectly. Whereas I feel a lot of times my words in English just, uh, now, we're supposed to. Paul said in Corinthians, you know, I will, I will uh, pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with my understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with my understanding. So he, he said to do both. <clears throat> and I'm just saying I feel so much more powerful when God is praying through me. And this one version says wordless groans. The other version says um, <clears throat> groanings too deep for words. I don't know how many of you have experienced... Um, like travail in the spirit, groaning, and like those wordless groans where, um, for me, it usually has uh, praying in tongues mixed into it. But it's the spirit of God <clears throat> taking you over because you yield to him and praying through you with these groans. You know, Jesus wept for Jerusalem. That was an act of prayer. Because we saw in Psalms 126 <clears throat> that, our, that our prayer, our tears are seeds. So when Jesus wept for Jerusalem, it wasn't just a, a moment where he was using up extra energy and weeping. It, it was effective. It was powerful. Something was happening in the spirit realm when Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem. It wasn't just tears. He wasn't just upset for them or, you know. There was a spiritual act happening. And God's been opening my eyes to this. Um, I haven't always understood why I would start crying. But it's a powerful thing, and it's something to be yielded to and to not be stopped. Don't stop it. And it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing around you. You yield to the tears. You yield to the wordless groans. And, and this groaning, um, a lot of people haven't experienced travail. And... I don't know if, if it's, 
I, I would think it's something everyone can, can, can experience. If you press into a certain place in the spirit, you're praying in tongues and you're engaged with God and he comes upon you, you can't make it happen. But when it does start happening, I usually feel like a heaviness. I feel like a, it's the glory of God, is the weighty, his weighty presence. I feel it coming on me and I feel this longing to go into prayer. That just that pulling, like almost like I feel depressed, but it's not a natural depression. It's like this pulling into a, a deep place that you just sense. And when you give into it, you can resist it, because I have resisted that before. And just went about my work because I was busy and I wasn't engaged. I wasn't I didn't have ears to hear and eyes to see at that moment. But there have been so many other times when I have given into it and I'll just pray in tongues and the Spirit of God just starts praying through me. And it's deep, it's guttural, and a lot of times, you, I think you've all heard me probably, it's, it, is, it is crying out and very loud, almost always. It gets very loud, and you're just, I'm just yielding to the Spirit of God, and He's doing what He needs to do through me. And there's power that's being released. So we all need to be open to this, because God is doing things through us in those moments that He's not doing any other time, I, I believe. Yeah, he's certainly not doing it when I'm praying in English, because I just don't think he is. <laughs> okay, the language of prayer is the language of the heart, and it's not limited to the vocabulary of the mind. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to read you another quote, but you can turn to John 11, and we're going to close with that. The heart cry of the Holy Spirit is just too deep for human words. At times, the depths of the Holy Spirit's praying become groanings within our hearts that express a prayer desire that's so infinite that it's incapable of being expressed totally in man's natural language. The heart cry of the Holy Spirit is just too deep for human words. At times, the depths of the Holy Spirit's praying become groanings within our hearts that express a prayer desire that's so infinite that it's incapable of being expressed in English. It cannot be expressed in English. Why else would he give us these groanings, you know, in Romans 8, 26? Why would he? If, if he could just lead us to pray everything out in English, why would he give us a prayer language? Because there are things we don't know how to pray for, and maybe, perhaps, as this is saying, as this James Gall is suggesting, maybe there aren't words. That, that could be formed together to complete the thought of what God is trying to make happen in the spirit. Maybe our words don't contain the power. Maybe it's only his groans and his, his supernatural language that contains what needs to be released in this earth. Therefore, we are a vessel and we are a tool and we are a conduit for God to flow through and use us. And that's why he gave us the supernatural language. That's why he gave us this ability to engage with him and go deeply into places of groaning. <clears throat> Spirit-born groaning is always in accordance with God's will. Um, yeah, oh, it's just, this book is like so good. I highly recommend it. Um, okay, Luke chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 17. We're going to close and head to church. Oh, I'm surprised you didn't say something about Lazarus. He cried for Lazarus. Luke, you know? wait a minute. Luke, John. John, sorry, John 11, 17. It is Lazarus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another prophetic friend. <laughs> All right. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus has already, had already been dead. Okay, we're going to skip a lot of this. Um, got to look at verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I love that. Okay. Now, verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. In the Greek, the words deeply moved means to groan. I didn't write down the Greek word, but it moved, means to be moved with anger, to snort with anger like a horse. <laughs> yeah, that's in the Greek. Jesus was deeply moved with anger in his spirit and troubled. Was he, what was he mad about? 
I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, he's, like, upset that Lazarus died. <laughs> no. Unbelief. Yeah, their unbelief. He's like, didn't I tell you, you know, if you just believe, you'd see the glory of God. And then and she's like, well, yeah, in the resurrection. And he's like, <laughs> no, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> Come on, just believe me. <laughs> so, you know, he, he allowed Lazarus to die. He stayed away two extra days. We've all heard this taught. He allowed him to die so that he could come back and show the goodness of God in raising him from the dead. And people teach that, you know, death glorifies God and sickness glorifies God. No, he raised him from the dead. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. Okay. Come and see, Lord, they replied. In verse 35, Jesus wept. There's that prayer of tears again. He's weeping because of their unbelief. He's weeping because of the situation. Why don't they believe I'm the resurrection and the life? They know me really well. In verse 36, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Oh. But some of them said, couldn't this guy who opened the eyes of the blind kept this guy from dying? And they're starting to reason in their hearts. Um, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. He sighed repeatedly and he groaned in the spirit. Deeply moved. He sighed repeatedly. So even a... He sighed repeatedly. God heard that as a prayer. because, And we're going to go on and see how we know he heard it as a prayer. <clears throat> then Jesus said in verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. What did he say in prayer to the Father that the Father heard him? He groaned, he sighed, he snorted like a horse. I don't even want to try that right now. Might have something come out. Um, that's what he's saying. I thank you, Father, that you have heard me. I know you always hear me, but I said this out loud, this prayer, for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Thank you for hearing me. What did he hear? He heard weeping. He heard sighing. He heard groaning. And that was Jesus' prayer. Oh my goodness, that makes me wonder. Because we don't, we don't hear a whole lot about it. We hear Jesus went away and prayed. All night he was in prayer on the mountain. They had to look for him the next day because he was over here praying. You know, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. John 17, he's praying. We get firsthand, first eyewitness account of Jesus praying to the Father and what he says when he prays. And then we have, you know, like Matthew chapter 6 where he says, well, pray, or 7, and pray in this way, you know, our Father, hallowed be your name. But other than that, it's like, you know, we don't really hear him praying to the Father. We don't hear what he says. But he sighed, he was groaning, he was moved deeply in his spirit in anger at the unbelief and, it, and maybe even just this, that Satan killed Lazarus. Like, you know, he, that could have been part of... He came to destroy the works of the devil, and that, there's probably this righteous anger that gets stirred up in him when he's destroying those works. That means God hears us when we sigh deeply. He hears it as a prayer that's effective and fervent and avails much. He sees our tears, and he catches them, and he regards those as prayers that are effective and fervent and availing much. Mm -hmm. Which means we need to move in these areas so that he can hear this stuff. Yeah. And it's seed that's being sown so we can reap a harvest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, this, I totally got that just now from James Gall. I, I had never seen that before. I always wondered... Thank you that you heard me, and he didn't say anything to the Father, but I didn't get it, you know. Maybe he prayed silently in his heart, but weeping, sighing, groaning, it's all effective types of prayer. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Father God, I ask that you would fall upon us. <coughs> in this room, Lord, these people represented here, that you would fall upon us in this way, that you would begin sighing through us, and you'd begin weeping through us, God, and you would begin groaning through us, Father, and that you would travail through us, God, and we would 
um, by those forms of prayer, among all the other forms you've given us, Lord, that we would see revival and awakening wherever we live, God, wherever we go to church and where we represent, Father, Northwestern Pennsylvania, God. God, we ask that you would fall upon Northwestern Pennsylvania, that you would just put your hands powerfully, God, under Northwestern Pennsylvania, and you would flip us on our heads, Father, that you would flip us over, God, that we would do um, great and mighty works, Father, in this region, and that there would be revival and awakening, Father, that you'd wake up the saints, Lord, and that you would wake up the people who are sleeping, who are spiritually dead, God, and you would just swoop in, Father, that you would come in and you would fall upon us, Lord. God, we, we need you, Father. We need you. And, Lord, I pray that you would make us just like the guy in Luke 11 where he just kept knocking and kept demanding and saying, but you're my friend, you're my friend. I, I need your help, I need your help. God, you are our friend and you have told us to put you in remembrance of your word and you have said you're looking all over the earth to find people who will stand in the gap. And Lord, we say that we are people who will stand in the gap. We are people, Father, who you can move through. Lord, I ask that you'd make us sensitive. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, what the Spirit is saying to our region, Father God. Lord, I thank you that you are moving in power, God, and you are using us as your tools, as a conduit to flow through, Father, and to bring change. Now, Lord, I ask that you'd sensitize each of us and that you would give each of us prayer assignments that you give each of us that longing and that drawing, Father, to go away and to pursue your heart. And, and that we wouldn't um, be locked into a certain box or, or a certain way of, of thinking prayer has to look. But we'd be willing just to groan and to cry if that's what you want us to do. And it, Lord, if you give us something to declare or pray in English, then that's what we'll do. And if you want us to pray in tongues, Lord, then that's what we'll do. But God, we ask that you would take charge of our prayer times, Lord, and that you would make them effective and fervent so that they would avail much. Yes. We bless you, Father. We bless you, Lord. And, and we just thank you for Megan, Lord, as she's going to be addressing the church today. And I thank you for your anointing upon her and Robert, God. And we thank you that you would choose <coughs> Lord, that you would choose their words, Father, yes. and that they would speak prophetically from your heart, yes. Lord. And that you would um, deposit life into us, God. Yes. Deposit life into our hearts and minds as they speak today, God. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness mm -hmm. and your mercy mm -hmm. and your movement. In Jesus' name, mm -hmm. amen. amen.